How's it going guys? Cole there. We're back again. We're dropping yet another video. Part two of the bouncer video, doing the doors, right? I'm just taking you through, like, I don't know why I'm really doing it. I just, uh, it just came into my head. I thought, let's cover the door. We don't really talk about when I did the doors, right? And the people I met and how the job went and babysitting piss heads for a living and fighting and door sluts. Do What's a door slut? A door slut, uh... In every pub, in every club, where there are bouncers, you will have women that have some sort of a fetish. I don't know if that's the right word, but a fetish for doorman. They like doorman. They have a favourite doorman. Um, and these women, right, you could be the ugliest guy in the world, right? Example, I'm not the best looking, right? And you can pull. You can, it's very easy to pull. Plus the drunk as well, that's another reason. I had this rule that I wouldn't say drunk women that were hammered back and have sex with them. Why? Because personally, I don't think it's right. Um, I think that when your inhibitions are lowered and these women can't stand up and they're throwing up and how can you, how can these women really have consent for sex, right? When they are that inebriated, that pissed, right? I don't think they can. Uh, so I had like an unwritten rule that I wouldn't take women back if they was tipsy, right, then I probably would. But again, it was on the level of drunkness that I, I, I would make my uh, my choice and everything. But in every in every like pub club, there are always these women that they have some. They, they just need to jump on a bouncer's penis, cock, whatever you want to call it. They're just these sort of women. They they are out there, and you know who you are. Like right? any guys that have watched this, anyone that's done the doors will know there are women. Not all of them, by the way. There's a lot of women that think bouncers are cocky, arrogant, steroid-filled, small penis, angry men. Uh, they're also women that love us. When it comes to the punters, right, you, you, like I said, the way that you are seen as a bouncer is reflected in the way you speak and treat people. Now, the reason that I was a popular doorman, right, is because I put my... I, I, I'm... I don't know. I used to just put myself. I've been the pissed up person that I've kicked out. I, I have been the pisshead. I've been the drunk person. I've been the one. When I was in the army, I was in phase two training down at the War School of Artillery in Lark Hill, Salisbury Plain, right? Um, and we was in Salisbury and I was hammered, right? And I was literally like, I was projectile vomiting on the dance floor, right? I was just, I was just bad times, right? And I got kicked out. It is what it is. Um, but yeah, so when I of the mindset of a bouncer. Number one, I was bullied as a kid, right? So that's one reason that I never, I didn't say, some bouncers take the job extremely serious. Some some people that do the doors don't take the job serious enough. They just think, go to a thing, you have all my hair slicked back and I'm going to pull tonight, right? And it's not the right way. Uh, I had an old school mentality, definitely. And like I said, I'm only 36 now when I was doing the doors for about nine, 10 years, right? And... The way that I treated the regulars, right, it doesn't, I'm a big lump, right, all that shit, right, but I didn't need to show that I can fight, I didn't need to walk around with a chip on my shoulder, because I've been bullied as a kid, and now I'm a big lad, and I can fight, right, my attitude was, when it came to the job, was these regulars are out for a good time, we're there to protect them, and we're there to give it so they can get off they can get off the face whether that's on drugs whether it's on drink right they can get off the face knowing that people are protecting them and got their backs in the in the worst case scenario right uh, and it goes on guys people have been raped on nights out uh people have been physically assaulted um sexually assaulted it goes on guys right when your inhibitions are lowered mad things happen and a lot of these people that are under the influence of alcohol or drugs can't remember what's gone on right um, but the, when it came to the regulars, because I'd been the drunk that I'd kicked out, I had that mindset and I just thought, it's only a job. It Don't take it like... I took it serious in the sense of I was there to protect people, right? And I know that sounds weird and like I wasn't a job's worth. I just knew that I had to have my wits about me because if I didn't, something could potentially happen to some of these people inside the club and... I couldn't sleep with myself and live with myself if I didn't do the right by them. So when there was, ah, fucking hell, right? I've had it on a door where the guy was pissed up, right? It was only a skinny little scrawny thing. And he went to swing for me, right? And I just stepped back and he just swung around and like, like did a 180 and fell on the floor, right? This was in the village, this, in the gay village in Manchester. 
Uh, I, his mates were nowhere to be seen. I picked him up. I walked him to the taxi. Right? And I, I knew the guy, because there was a queue for the taxi, right? And I knew the guy who was doing security. So I just said to him, listen, let me get my guy in. So I, I squeezed past the queue, put him in a taxi, um, got his fucking like driving license out and said, right, I think this is his address. He went, yeah, yeah, yeah. So taxi driver took him. His mates, so his mates, so he went home and that was the end of that. His mates come out and said, where is he? And he said, oh, well, I said, well, he swung for me. And he said, oh, please, you didn't hit him. He's not a fighter. I said, no, no, I didn't hit him. I'm not a bully. Uh, I said, but I've got him in a taxi and I've got him home. And he said, you actually did that? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, he's drunk, man. I said, what am I going to get from digging a drunk guy? I I'm not a bully. What what is to be gained by hammering, hitting, knocking out, sparking out someone that can't physically stand up, barely stand up, can't even throw a punch without falling over? There's nothing to be gained by that. There are bouncers out there, let me tell you, that would have absolutely cleaned his clock and wiped him out. I wasn't one of them. Um, like I said, I'm not. I, when I worked the doors, I wasn't the big hard man, the big I am. No, just it was just a job. So when I used to go to work, I I used to I I loved it, man. I absolutely loved it, and like I said. I got in the job for two reasons. One, because I like to protect people. And two, because I wanted to, I, I, I love violence and it was commonplace. And this was a way of like getting fights and conflicts and stuff. And I used to search for it, I'll be honest with you. I, I never looked, I never went out looking for it, but I knew on the doors it would find me. Um, so yeah, so like I said, I worked all over. Um, I worked in Manchester, like I said, Billy Rocks, worked in Oldham, like I said, Club 25s, the Hare and Hounds, uh, I think it was called Blue 62 or 62s, uh, Club 62 or something in Oldham on uh, on Yorkshire Street, I used to work there, worked at Drake's in Rochdale, Regal Moon in Rochdale, Yates's Wine Bar, Liquid Rock in uh, thing. I worked at Chicago Rock as well in Rochdale, Berry, uh, worked at Sol Viva, I worked at Ronnie's on the Rock, I worked at Temptations, which was a lap dancing bar. Um, I worked at Club MV. Um, I, I loved it, man. I absolutely loved it. And I used to work in Batley as well. Batley, the, the people in Batley, I just... Pff, the people in Batley, I don't think I've ever left Batley. Like, I was on a door with a mate of mine, right, Lloyd, who was on, on with the Noonans. Uh, cage fighter. Looks like he's in a boy band. I can fucking fight and then some. Like, we was on a door in Batley. And a group of girls come to the door, right? And we got told it was a troublesome spot, right? It wasn't on the mile, the golden mile, as they call it. We was just off there near the train station. It was called Club Auctions, right? So a group of girls come to the door. And we were Manx, obviously, as you can tell by the accent. So I've gone, yeah, girls, you got any ID? And she went, here, mate, here, mate. You're not from round here, mate, you. Are you from Leeds, you? It's like, do I sound like I'm from Leeds? And her mate went, here, lass, don't be silly. Like, he's clearly from that Liverpool, isn't he? I thought, Liverpool, have you heard this accent? Mank through and through. And she was arguing about where I was from. I was just like, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we used to work on there. Um, Batley was, I love Batley. It was a nice little spot, man. Now, the guy that got us the job, right, G, he was on a program called Bouncers back in the day that used to follow the Frontier. The Frontier is probably the best known club in Batley. Um, and they, he, G used to run, or he, yeah, I think it was Ed Dorman, or second in command of Frontier, right? And he got us, he, he like reached out and we got the graft and we used to travel from Manny over there and work there. Um, or another club that I've worked at in Manchester, right? Now, there was three clubs at the time in Manchester that were extremely dangerous clubs. Ampersand, which was on Deansgate Locks, Paparazzi in the print works, and Hidden, which were club pressure, which it was Havana, then it became Hidden. No, then it became club pressure, then it became Hidden, right? Now, this club... And I spoke about this on the Sean Atwood podcast, right? This club, right, um, was, at the time, I think, was owned. It wasn't owned when we were there, but a guy used to have it, and I think he was part of the Pepper Hill uh, gang and all that. It was a Moss Side gangster. I like, used to run around with all the gangs and down there, Moss Side, cheat him, uh, Moss Side lot, so Gooch, Doddington. I, I was, obviously, I'm going to go on to the Gooch in a minute. So, yeah, so... He ended up doing... I think he was head of security, if I remember. He didn't own the club. He was head of security. And the club, the entrance to the club, right? It was on the high street. I was just down there the other week. Last week, a few days ago, right? And it's where the tram tracks run through the thing. There's a club there, right? It's closed down now. Uh, it was Ruby Lounge then, and it closed down. But this club was downstairs. You used to walk in, right? There was like an airport-style scanner, at like a like you know one of the metal detectors that you get at court, Right? So you walk, you'd walk in, you'd empty your pockets, you put them into a tray, 
you 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 go through right the, the light would go off for stuff you get wanded you get patted down right take your stuff check your wallets and stuff make sure you got no weapons no drugs you go down the stairs they get down the stairs all the hallway by the way ceiling floor was all bulletproof right i'll put a link in the description for the documentary that i'm referring to um it was a small part of it, it was about the salford gangs it was on bravo and they show you the club and everything, the entrance, right? So you walk in, there's a metal detector, you go downstairs, there's like another metal detector, right? Another like archway, go under it, put all your things there, go through it, get patted down again, like more thoroughly. Then you finish that point of security. Then there would be, you know, the like, when you go to the petrol station, you've got the thick glass screen, bulletproof glass screen and the little drawer thing you put your five or ten or whatever it was on there they'd pull it in they press a button and you go through like one of them turnstiles that you get at the football well used to get at the football stadiums then you are actually finally in the club um i worked there on the door right when it was club hidden i was the only white doorman on a team of asian and blacks men i was the only white boy um and it was full of it for every gang in Manchester used to frequent this club. Gooch, Doddington, Cheetah Mill, um, do you know what I'm saying? Just other just criminal firms, just it was the worst. I swear to God, I used to go to work and I had the I had the most strongest bulletproof vest I've ever owned, right? Now it sounds dramatic, but I had I had a ceramic plate in the front and a ceramic plate in the back, capable of stocking an AK-47. Now that was a bit thingy, but the thing is, it was that sort of place where you didn't know on a night if you was ever going to go home. And I'm going to go into it a little bit more at the moment, right? So I worked on this door. It was full of gangbangers and everything. Uh, it was open a few nights. They used to have a ladies' night on a Thursday, but again, the gang lads used to come in. Um, strippers, they used to have male strippers, two male strippers, used to pull women up on the stage. One night, this big black guy, uh, stripper, pulled a one of the gang lads thingies on i thought oh my god there's going to be murder here anyway she quickly ushered off and that was like pulled someone else up it was sweet um be they used to play like you know the hip-hop like fat joe a lean back a lean back uh, it was all gangster rap hip-hop it was that sort of vibe right in the club now the door team was, it was, they doubled up on door team and then some, right? You've got thick, you've got massive bouncers on the door. I wasn't one of the bigger ones. You've got meatheads, just meatheads on the door. You've got us lot inside, again, we're all going like, we had a little thing. If it went off, we all go back to back in a circle and we just have to go, right? Uh, the, the door used to get frequently rushed by the gang lads, Darky and all those from the Gooch. Darky's got one eye. Darky was one of the seniors of the Gooch at the time. Uh, they used to run, they used to try and charge a door and stuff and like that, turn up strapped. And it was a mad, mad, fucking very paranoid, like door shift. It really was. Um, never ever felt as like, unsafe as I did when I worked at this door. And it's nothing to do with a team I work with. A team I work with, I trusted with my life. It's just, you know, that you could walk outside. Yeah, it was secure and everything. The, when we was working there, these air store, air, airport style scanners and everything and turntables, they all, the turnstiles, they all went, right? So it used to be, it was just fucking mental. Like I said, I'll put a link in the description for the Salford documentary. And it's talking about Salford lads and the Moss side, Cheetah Mill, Doddington, Gooch, all the, the notorious gangs that were known throughout the city of Manchester. Then you had the offshoots like the LSC, Longsight Crew, um, OTC, the Old Trafford Crips, and all these gangs, yeah, that were about, yeah. Um, and literally, right, the other two clubs, Paparazzi and the Printworks, was notoriously bad, right? Um, you're talking early 2000s, mid-2000s, right? Onwards, right? It was bad. Ampersand, down on Deansgate Locks, another extremely dangerous club but those three clubs for me yeah you had sankey soaps yeah you had the um, like sankey soaps and all that sort of stuff but nah 100 percent paparazzi ampersand and fucking club havana you might know it's club havana you might know it's club pressure you might know it's hidden right it ended up being the ruby lounge it became a little indie joint and everything the club was downstairs i actually got shot out of the back of this club right so what had happened right was i was working one night Right, and I was on the bar now. Round the bar, they used to right. They used to have you know the like the the um, like fridges that they have behind the bar. Right, well there was one full of Cristal, Don Perignon, all that stuff. Right, now the the thickness. Right, they used to have a chain around it. Right, they used to have a chain around it, like a strong tight chain with a big fucking thick padlock because gang lads used to go behind the bar, 
and help themselves. That's why we got the contract, right? So it was, honest to God, I can't stress how dangerous this club was. It was fuck. It wasn't the biggest club in the world and everyone had their own little corners, all the gang members, all the gang lads had their own little corners and segregated areas. It was fucking mad. Um, and the music as well and the tension, you could just feel it. Anyway, so this night, right, the end of the night's come, everything's swimmingly. Like I said, it's a very paranoid existence in this club working there. Um, and everyone's left. There's one guy at the bar, right? And he was giving shit to this barmaid on some next level, right? Giving a bare abuse, yeah. Stocky kid, leather jacket. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I said, so I put my hand on his shoulder. Mistake number one, really. Um, it's classed as disrespect. You put your hand on another man's shoulder, it's disrespect, right? Now, I'm all about respect, but you, if you give respect, you get respect back. But I'd already broke code number one. I know this. So I touched my hand on his shoulder and said, yeah, bro, he can't speak to like that. Come on. Right? Um, and so he's like, he shrugged me off. Don't touch me. So I was like, all right, here we go. Here we go. Right? But the rest of the shift, they was up, like, most of the, like, they was cleaning the toilets out and everything. Everyone had, everyone was, like, being around, like, corralled out of the door, right? There's one guy left at the bar. Everyone else is going up the stairs. They're getting away out. The door staff follow them up, like, herding them like sheep to get them out of the club. So I just said, yeah, bro, come on. So he's like, yo, don't fucking touch me, bro, right? So he's like, listen, you little slag to her. So I get in the way, right? And he's, like, trying to look around me. Anyway, so... We get him to the, I walk him to the stairs and everything. He said, I'm going to walk, bro. Don't fucking touch me, bro. I'm going to walk on my own. So he walks out of the club, right? Don't disrespect me, all this stuff. I'll be back. So we get to the door, yeah? Right? And he goes, listen, I'll be back, yeah? No, no, no. He said, he said, I'll be seeing you again. That's what he said. I'll be seeing you again, right? So anyway, cut a long story short. So we close the shutter. Everyone goes downstairs. I take my bulletproof vest off. I'm going back to the birds this night, right? Yeah, man. Now my phone, my phone, yeah, was low on charge, yeah, like proper low. So I, so one of the doormen, Biggie, I said to Biggie, I said, "Yo, Biggie, I said, let me get me charging out of your car, bro." So I've gone upstairs, right? So the club's downstairs, like I've told you. Everyone at the end of a shift, at the end of a door shift, right? Take your vests off, take your coat off, take your tie off, open your shirt, have a few beers. When you've worked the doors and you're in a high pressured highly strung environment with loud music and stuff. The adrenaline runs through you, right? So when you finish the shift, you need to take the edge off and you need to calm down, right? So I come up, so Biggie follows me up, right? Um, so we go at the back of the club, um, that you've got the cash office downstairs, you walk up the stairs at the back of the club into a ginnel at the back, yeah? Now, it's a big re steel, steel reinforced like fire door thing, right? Just... Cash offices at the bottom of the stairs make sense. So we come out of the door. So I've gone to the car and I get the charger. As I get the charger, the kid that I've kicked out fucking 10, 15 minutes before comes to the back of the club, right? There's a light at the end because there's a main road there. I think it's called, I can't think what it's called. I think, is it Dale Street or it becomes Dale Street? Anyway, so it's there. It's near the fucking Arndale Market. I'm at the back, literally in a, in a back alley. Biggest cars there. I've gone and got the I've gone and got the charger, bringing the thing about. Biggie was just opening the door. So as I've ran back for the door, right, this kid produces a shooter, right, and he starts firing, he starts popping off, right. But the thing is, he's held it side. He's held right. He's, you're supposed to go double hand. You never interlock your thumbs because you can break your thumbs, right. But like, you're supposed to hold it like this, two handed. Pop, 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 right? Because of the kick and everything, two hands, you've got control of the kick because the kick's going to take the barrel up, right? Now, he, he literally was like this to the side, yeah? Like you see in the American fucking films. And it was pop, 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 pop. So as he was firing, I ran back to the door, right? Um, now, he did say he'd be seeing me again, didn't he? Right. Didn't any say anything else? Didn't say you're gonna be dead or anything like that. No big talk like these dickheads. You used to get these dickheads. Do you know who I am? And I thought, well, if I if you don't know, how am I supposed to know? Them sort of muppets. You know what they're like. Ten a penny. This kid was legit. So he's firing at me. I went back to the door. Now Biggie was closing the door, so I gripped the door, pulled the door a little bit, go through, grab through the gap, close the door, and make sure it's locked. Right. The kid reloads and carries on firing at the door. Right. And like I said, the stairs are like this. They go down. So the door, so the bullets are ricocheting off a door. Ting, ting, ting. Can you hear the, can you hear the thud, right, of the of the, of the bullets smashing the door, yeah? Um, so if, if it wasn't for that door being reinforced, genuinely, I would have got it in the head, the back, or the spine that night. One million percent. I would have been dead. Um, I left my ass at the top of the stairs, as you can probably imagine. Um, 
yeah, it was a really, really like, I was like, Phew. my ass was, it was one of them. I, I came close that night a thousand percent. Now, so I go downstairs and everything. And Dave, who was the owner, was like, oh, so he rings the police and everything. Now it comes out. Right, so they, so they ring the police, armed police are deployed, they put a containment on because obviously they spent shells and everything and start, the forensics turn up and start putting fucking things over the bullets, right? I ref The police were like, right, we need to speak to you, we need to get statements from everyone. Now it transpired, right, that the female that worked behind the bar, it was a first shift, she had a son with this cheetah mill kid, right? I know the kid's name, I'm not going to say his name, right? But she had a kid with a kid from, from this kid, right, from cheetah mill. Right. Now, she did a midnight flit, abusive relationship, blah, blah, blah. She did a midnight flit with a kid right, and wasn't letting him see the kid Then moved out somewhere south of Manny and was traveling in. Right, She got the job. It was the first shift at the club. Right, Now, she'd been in the back all night uh, and then she ends up at the front and then he spots her and think, she stops him seeing the kid and all this. Right, So he was like fucking raging. Yeah, um, It was a madness. Honestly, it was a mad thing. Right, So... The police are like, they're trying to talk to everyone, take statements. I, from a criminal cloth, will not speak to the police. So I just said, no, I've got nothing to say. And I said, you've just been shot at, we need to speak to you. I said, I'm not obliged to give you a statement. Um, so I said to Biggie, I said, right, I said, can we get off? Um, and we had to wait a bit longer because he was doing the, the forensics and everything like that. Uh, they, the, everything was then lifted. We was able to get off and that was the end of it. Uh, and I was working the next night as well. But like I said, I'd, eat, I'd actually taken my vest off. The reason that that guy didn't hit me was probably because, one, he was under the influence of drugs or drink. Two, because of the way he held it. Single-handedly holding a pistol, with a, knowing what the kick of a pistol is. Right, double-handed, never interlock your thumbs because the kick can break fucking your thumbs, right? So you you grab your wrist and then you'd fire. A straight arm, straight arm, and then bam, 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 right? But he fucking, like I said, he was cocked, his elbows, so the kick's gonna, like, it's gonna have an impact and stuff. So anyway, so, um, yeah, and I was working the next night. They just tightened security on the venue. Um, that girl was never seen again, and that was the end of that. Um, like I said, the... the Things on the doors, the camaraderie, right? When I worked in Blackpool, I had the most amazing time. I worked in Blackpool, right? I worked at Club Sinoc, right? Me, Fergie, Cy, Ian, oh, under Big Dave. Big Dave was head of security. I tell you what, I worked for Stevie Swallows in Blackpool. It was the most amazing time on the doors I've ever had. I'd worked in the door on the doors in Blackpool previous. I used to work in Preston at Mood and Squires. Squires in New York, New York. Uh, and then at, sometimes I worked at Mood, sometimes I worked at Squires. Uh, and which is New York, New York and Squires. And then we used to work from, I used to work from 12 till six on the Laughing Donkey on the South Pier in Blackpool. Then we would travel um, from Preston, to, sorry, from Blackpool to Preston. So we'd work for, I'd work from 12 in the 12 noon till 6 p.m. Then we'd travel into Black, to Preston, whoever I was working with, one of my mates or something, Lloyd, for example. We'd travel into Preston and then we'd do the door in Preston. Right. And we worked till midnight, one o'clock in the morning, two in the morning. It was great. Then I ended up um, working at the Sunok, Club Sunok. Club Sunok was the second biggest club in Blackpool after the world famous Syndicate Nightclub. Syndicate Nightclub, revolving dance floor. First word you think of Syndicate, revolving dance floor, right? So yeah, we worked there. Um, and I absolutely loved it. It was genuinely just, the, we used to go, I used to travel up on a Tuesday book into like some B&B, &B, right? Just in North Shore, they used to look after me because my boss had it on lockers. So um I used to work, I'd stay, I'd stay there Tuesday, I'd get there Tuesday night, I'd work Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, travel back Monday, come back Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon, back to Blackpool, and then work Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. We used to have the Blackpool football team in there. You had the owner, uh, the Roystons, swarmy, horrible people, what they did to Blackpool Football Club, arrogant, I'm sure the old man's a pervert, he just looks like, looks the type, so yeah, used to go out, get pissed before work, hit it with the boys, so we used to meet, um, I can't remember what it's called, it's a bar number, I can't, is it bar 57, bar 57 sounds right, uh, so we used to go there, we used to meet up, we'd have, we'd have all our fucking door uniform on, smelling like a tart sandbag, fucking shaved head looking decent you can't polish your turd in my case go into the bar 
have a few drinks, go to like walk about, go to a few other bars, revivals, whatever it was called. It was a it was an eighties bar, Flares, Flares sounds familiar. So we used to go to Flares and all these other bars. We used to get on it for a few hours, right before, like not I weren't on the sniff or anything, just drink, um, and then we'd go to the club, tipsy as fuck, and luckily. Very rarely I had to go on a door, right? You had like three entrances to the club. You had one that went up an alleyway um, to the to like the um, smoking area and everything. The outside area, it was all fenced off and everything. Uh, and the doorman was there, Tony and everyone. Then you had one entrance like near the, is it Metropolitan Hotel? And then you had one at the back, which was like the VIP. And we used to get Blackpool players in there. Um, I remember one night... Um, we had all the Blackpool players in. Now, one of the lads that used to play for my team, Oldham, right? Um, I can't think of his fucking name, though. Neil Erdley. Neil Erdley. He played left back or right back. I can never remember. But he came to the club, and I was talking to him about Oldham, and he said, yeah, I used to play for Latics. I said, I know. So we used to have a chat with him. We used to get all the boxers up and stuff. We used to get soap stars traveling to Blackpool as well. I remember, right? Because I used to live in Denton, yeah. I used to work in Denton as well. But I was on the door at Sunok, and... Rosie Webster, she, I can't remember her real name off the top of my head, but she came uh, to, she came with a group of girls and I said, oh, and she's called Brooke Vincent, that's her real name, Brooke Vincent. I said, hiya, Brooke, because I lived in Denton, she was in, she's from Ordenshaw. So I said, listen, I said, hiya, Brooke, and she sort of looked at me, I said, I watched Corrie, I said, I live in Denton, you're in Ordenshaw. I said, I know, like, she probably thought stalker, weirdo. Anyway, so I said, listen, girls, drop me to get your VIP? And she said, oh, if you would. I said, listen. So I just said to the girl behind the thing, it was um, Rachel. I said, Rachel, can I have a load of wristbands for these? She went, yeah, of course. So I gave them a load of VIP wristbands. They fucked off to VIP, and that was it. Um, but yeah, I just love the vibe. I love the camaraderie. Some fantastic fights in there. You used to get a lot of stag parties, hen parties, hen parties. Women, right, when it comes to violence in clubs, Right, the men are bad, yeah. They throw down. Some of them carry blades. You know what I'm saying? Women are unbelievable. Right, when a woman fights, right, everything's a weapon. Right, they're pulling the fucking hair, nails, trying to scratch their eyes out. They're trying to rip the fucking weave out of their head. Right, they're picking up glasses. One girl, right, there was a massive fucking fight between two empires, and me and Lloyd, right, Lloyd is the one from at home with the Noonans, a good friend of mine literally known him for, for many, many years, right? We, we ran doors together. Um, he was a safe guy, love Lloyd. He lives, he's over in Australia now, living the dream. Um, but yeah, so we were, we was the first two on the scene. These two empires, mate, were knocking the fuck out of each other. One of them was heavily pregnant, looked to be at least six, seven months old, uh, pregnant, uh, knocking the fuck out of each other. They're grabbing each other's head. There's pregnant birds in the middle fighting. I said, you're up the door. Oh, yeah, for fuck. Trying to finger it, pulling stilettos, try, uh, literally trying to embed this stiletto into this girl's head with a force of a man. I swear to God. And the weirdest thing was, they all look like little Barbie dolls. You know what I mean? There's a few rough ones. You always get the rough ones, don't they? But literally, like, trying to hammer each other out with these stilettos, yeah? Um... I used to love it, man. I just I just buzzed off it. Um, I had some really good scraps up there. Um, I'm reliving it, so I'm getting a bit hyped up. So, but the thing is, the job is a very dangerous job. The, the, the doormen are very underpaid. Because of the SIA coming in, the Security Industry Authority in the early 2000s, it tried to eradicate all the hard men, dangerous people that have been in prison, people that got criminal convictions for violence, GBH, Section 20s, Section 18s. Do you know what I mean? A lot of these lads that I've worked with have broken more jaws than fucking Valentino broke hearts, right? It's just the way it was. Now, when the SIA came in, it weeded these guys out and it left us with anyone can get a badge. Now, you get in, you get it. I've worked on a door with men. Just because you're a big lump and you're six foot four and sweaty stone doesn't mean you can fight. But these skinny lads were coming on the door and you can see that they've just that they've got nothing up, there's no physical presence about them. You've got to carry yourself a certain way. And these guys didn't. And these guys have replaced the old guard, the dangerous old guard that were fighters, right? And it makes a mockery of the security system because there's a lot of people out there that think, oh, well, how hard can it be to be a bouncer? You don't have to technically, academically, you don't need anything to be a bouncer. But good talking, my first weapon was my mouth. My second was my hands. But the thing is, again, because I wasn't a bully on the doors, right, I could have twisted people up and smashed people up day in, day out, week in, week out, right, just like a lot of other bouncers. I didn't take that course. I actually looked and thought, I just want people to have a good night and go home. Right? That was me, right? 
But like I said, you do get the exceptions and the wit and the idiots and everything like that. Some people just, you can't, they can't walk away and you end up fighting. But there's a lot of guys that work the doors that literally, they think, the, the, they think they're special. They think they're Johnny Bravo, like, hoo, 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 right? And they've got nothing about them, right? Now, being on steroids, right, makes you look good in a shirt, a tight-fitting shirt. Yeah, you're like, oh, I'm hench and all this stuff, right? But if you can't fight, right, there's no point you being there because if your ass is going to fall out the moment it kicks off, you might look good in a shirt. Women might love you with your little slick back fucking top knot. But if you can't fight, you're actually putting the other doorman you work with in danger, right? Another peep sort of doorman that I don't like, right? And we, we're all, everyone that's worked on a door is a womanizer. The amount of women that I have spoken to that's exes, they, they was with a bouncer, right? And then they, they get surprised. You meet him on the door, right? I've been, I got in a relationship with a girl that I met on the door at Solviva in Berry, right? Now, any doorman, right? I don't, listen, I've seen doormen take the fucking wedding ring off before a shift. Do you understand, right? Not all of them are, are womanizers, but a lot of them are, right? You get women throwing yourselves at you. Being a doorman, I, I don't know if these women look and think they're like rock stars or big hard men or they look good in a shirt and a tie or they want to be fucking, they want to rip the fucking ties off and just rip the shirts off and have it with them, right? I don't know what goes through women's head, but the, a lot of women are attracted to bouncers and bouncers obviously have the favourites and stuff like that and, Slags, you see the the girls that seem to attract the bouncers are the ones that they turn up at the club. They've not got much going from a looks. There are some stunning girls that attract Dorman as well, by the way. But some of them are dead rough. Jeremy Cow sort of waiting room, sort of rough birds, right? But they've got massive boobs. Now, if a girl's got big boobs, it doesn't matter how ugly her face is. Right? It doesn't matter how ugly that boat races. She's got good boobs. So when she's rocking up at the club, right, they're out here, right? And literally, what she's wearing doesn't leave much to the imagination. The, the nipples just more or less kept being kept in. They're literally plunging. And then she'll go, why are you looking at me tits? Well, if you didn't have them out, sweetheart, people won't look at them. Then you've got the other ones with the short skirts and stuff like that. The tight, hot pants because they've got a nice ass. Nothing going on up here. But then you've got double threat girls who've got tits, ass. Then you've got triple threats. You've got the good-looking girls with the great tits and the great asses. Right? Um, and the, like I said, they're just... They're just magnets for doormen. Not all of them. There's a lot of ugly doormen that have got laid because of the job they do. Um, there's also pull a pig night as well. If you're a bouncer, you'll know. Pull a pig night is where bouncers bet and say, right, you've got to, you, you've got to pull the ugliest woman. If you haven't pulled by a certain o'clock or you, you, it's like a competition with a doorman, so you can pull the ugliest bird, so you can pull the most numbers, so you can like pull the most digits, so you can pull... Whatever the case may be, right? Now, pull a pig. Pull a pig was a competition between doormen, right? Not all door teams have done it. I've been with a few door teams that have done it. And pull a pig is like a competition. You've got to pull the ugliest bird, right? Now, sometimes just get off with. Other times, you take them back, you sleep with them. You get the knickers. You, you get proof of you shagging them, like a little video or something, whatever it might be, um, for the proof and everything like that. You've had doorman. I had a doorman when I worked in Blackpool. He came and stick his fingers under my nose and said, get a whiff of them. Yep. It was that sort of night. And it, she, she, it smelled disgusting and I nearly threw up, right? Um, but yeah, the, the work in the doors was a hell of a time. I absolutely loved it. I wanted to work in... I ended up being... The first time I was a head doorman, I took over the door at Legends in uh, Ashton Underline. Anyone knows about Ashton? Back in the day, bedroom, Molly's... Denial, um, Legends, Chambers, right? F Boogie Wonderland, Ashton was amazing on a night out. You had Staley Vegas, Staley Bridge, for anyone that doesn't know that's not from Manchester. Staley Vegas or Staley Bridge. Staley Bridge as it's known, but people just universally knew it as Staley Vegas, right? So Ashton is like, like south of Oldham. Right? You've got Ashton on line, you've got Staley Vegas. Now, Ashton, let me tell you, the first ever door I worked at Ashton was Chambers, right? Now, Chambers was run by this guy called Glenn, right? Convinced he was a pedo, right? Uh, it was a fantastic club, though. It used to get armoured with people. The nightlife in Ashton was unbelievable. Um, got into some amazing scraps down there and everything like that. Didn't aim to get into a fight, just if it came, we're just fucking ready. So, we ended up working on there. Then I ended up in Denton. I ended up working at Last Orders in Denton, Last Orders in Hyde. Um, then I, I worked, when I worked the door in Denton, um, 
at the last orders in Denton and the last orders in Hyde, I was actually working for a gangster called Steve Akinyemi. John Breen and Steve Akinyemi, known as Aki, was shot dead in 2010 by Az Coglan. Uh, Aaron Coglan allegedly, they call him the Teflon Don, got away with allegedly three murders. 1994 murder of Chris Little, 1998 murder of David Barnshaw, who was a drug dealer who was forced to drink petrol, set on fire and locked in a car. Um, Chris Little was a bully boy from Stockport, was shot dead. He had a Rolex watch on. Uh, car pulls up for a van, shot into the car. He was driving a Mercedes, um, top down, topless uh, Mercedes, convertible even. Um, and he put his foot on the accelerator, creeps into a wall. That was the end of Chris Little. He was a bully boy. Um, David Barnshaw murder of 1998, allegedly. And then Steve Akinyemi or Aki from Cheetah Mill, who was shot dead in 2010. Aki, there was rumours he was a police informer. Greater Manchester Police said we will not confirm or deny if he was a police informer. I'm not going to get into all that. I used to work for Aki on the door. Um, and like I said, at last doors in Hyde and Denton. Then I went on to Legends in Ashton. Now, this club... Now, imagine Wigan Pier music, right? That sort of, like, MC sort of... every It's synonymous with drug-taking, with uh, recreational drugs, ecstasy, cocaine every drug you can imagine, right? It was just synonymous with. Now, when I worked at the door, there was a guy called, an Italian guy I worked called Sam. Only a little small guy, had nothing about him, wasn't a fighter. The owner of the club, Gavin Smith, who's no longer with us, God bless him. He wasn't the owner, sorry, he was the manager. Um, it was a massive building on the corner, right? As you went down to the old town, you had legends there. If you come out of legends and cross the road and go a bit further down on the right, you've got Molly's, further down you've got bedroom, right? Legends was just, you walked in and you just knew, I knew, I knew from the moment I walked in that door, there was going to be fucking trouble, right? There was more teeth on the floor than carpet, it stunk, everyone was off the face, people had been drinking all day, they had MCs on, they had DJs on, they just the music was mental. Anyway, so when I start working there, I rock up and wear my bulletproof vest, I always used to wear my bulletproof vest having been shot at as I've alluded to. Um, so Gavin said to me, right, see them lads in the corner? They're the West End boys. The West End's an area of Ashton, right? And he was all in trackies and everything, group of them, white lads, black lads. You get the picture. Um, they're all into mingling and stuff. They're all there in trackies. So I've gone over and I said, who's in charge? So there was a kid called Kang, right? He's no longer with us, God bless him. So uh, I said to Kang, I said, listen, your lads are going to have to go, uh, get some jeans or whatever, come back, you sweet. Always speak to people with respect. Doesn't matter if it's like some skinny ass muppet or if it's a gang leader or a, like someone that was in charge of this gang at the time. So speak to people with respect. You get respect back. That's how I live my life. Um, so they, they ended up after a bit of humming and ahhing. I said, let you finish your drinks, bro. It's sweet. Give it. They started to take the piss a bit. So then I said, look, bro, you're going to have to. So anyway, so they walked out of their own esteem, respect and all that stuff. They went out, they got the jeans and they came back, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I remember walking to the toilet and it was always in and out of the toilet, right? And when I'm on the door, I watch. I suffer with a thing called hypervigilance, right? Complex PTSD with hypervigilance. My hypervigilance, I watch surroundings, I watch body language, I watch what people are saying, what they're not saying. I read subjects to, 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 to perceive any potential threats, right? It's kept me out of harm's way. So they're in and out of the thing and all that, and I thought, right, these lot are fucking at it. So I started to search people on the door and started to take drugs off people. Now, this gang, I said to him, I said, I'll tell you what, bro, I said, the senior boys in the, in, in the club, yeah, doing bits and pieces, right? I said, listen, I said, I'm getting a shit wage here. I'm on £15 an hour. I said, you want to make money. I want to make money. I said, how about making a deal? He said, go on, I'm listening. I said, right. So we'll search everyone that comes into the club, buy your boys, right? And if there's any police coming in, undercover police, whatever, I said, what we'll do, if because obviously sometimes the police would show us of the fucking, like, we'd say, oh, like, not, because if someone looked too shady, police-wise, and just looked like a copper, I'd just say, you got any ID or something like that? And they flashed the warrant card, right? So I said, if there's any if there's any police coming or whatever, I'll let you boys know, whatever. I said, you guys can have 100% of the club take, at, like, of the, of the drug scene in here. I want a backhander. I'll search everyone that comes in the club, uh, apart from your lads, whatever drugs I take, I'll take them, but I'll sell them back to you at half the price. Now, at the time, um, well, at the time, it's still the same now. Uh, a one to one gram of cocaine bashed was 40 quid, right? So I would sell it back to them at 20. They make money, I make money. And the amount of drugs coming through the door of this club was fucking unbelievable, right? Um, 
And so this was the deal. So every week they used to turn up, they used to give me backhand, the backhand offer. So they used to pay me for a week, yeah. So I was only there, f I think Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Friday, Saturday. Sometimes it was a Thursday, sometimes a Sunday. It depends if they had someone on. So yeah, that was how it turned out. Anyway, it turned out that these lads were the Gooch gang, right? Uh, Hassan Cha, Aaron Alexander, Kyle Wynn, Ricardo Narada Williams, all these boys, right? Now, one of the kids that used to run with the Gooch lads was a kid called Martel. Martel, when they ended up murdering uh, Yu Cal Chin, and then at his weight, they shot into Forbes, you close, shot Tyrone Gilbert, right? Um, one of the lads turned QE, Queen's Evidence, right? Martel. He ended up sending the gang down, right? He'd give locations and things of firearms and stuff, and they got done for a whole host. Colin Joyce, Lee Alex, uh, Lee Amos, Colin Joyce, and all the lads, 11 of them went down for a total of like, I think it was 247, 257 years between 11 of them. Murder, counts to firearms, drugs, conspiracy, all the usual stuff, right? So yeah, so I used to run around with them. I used to sell drugs on the door for them. Uh, then obviously the murders went down and that was that. They went to jail. I moved on to another door. Crazy as it sounds, right? Um, gangsters, doormen, security companies, gangsters, hard men, reputations, all go hand in hand. Um, I ended up once, right? I met, uh, there's so many things about the doors that I could go into that I just are just slipping through my mind right now. So one night I went with, with me and Lloyd, me and my mate wanted to work on the doors together, right? So what we did was we went to meet a company boss down at Factory. Factory is on Princess Street in Manchester. You might, if you Google Factory Nightclub Bouncers, right, you'll see a big hoo-ha where the bouncers were twatting people left, right and centre, uh, years after us anyway. So we went to meet him and he was a bit of a knob, right? And uh, he said to us, there he goes, listen, I'll put you lads on the warehouse project, right? And I thought, oh, I can't be asked for that. And he was like, yeah, but it's like, it's, yeah, it's here, there, it might be here, it might be there. And I thought, right, I thought, nah. So we went and sat in Joshua Brooks. Anyway, fast forward, I sat there and we was right near the gay village, right? So I said to him, I said, how about the gay village, right? The gay village is famous across England, nightlife, gay scene is banging in Manchester. Not literally, right? So anyway, so I said, why don't we, go up the Canal Street right, and try and get into bars and clubs and try and say, look, we'd like to take the door. What I was banking on, Lloyd's a good looking lad. I'm rough as shit. So what I wanted to do is you, you cause I thought they'll be attracted to Lloyd, right? So I'll pull him up there, literally pawn him, pump him out, right? P pimp him out even. So we literally go from club to club. Most of these clubs wouldn't even let us in, right? And then we got to Crunch. Now Crunch, the doorman, right? Um, foreign guy and he was in a situation that was getting out of hand and he couldn't deal with it so me and Lloyd deal, dealt with it right we, we diffused it we took everyone out dead calm dead chilled right now this doorman had a reputation for being quite violent right so we dealt with it uh, he shook our hands we've gone to the bar now the manager the, the assistant manager was there so he said to us there he said right uh, he said he said I liked how you dealt with that I said well it's funny you should say that because we, we want to take the door so we had a little chat back and forth left him our number uh, that was it continued with our night trying to get into other clubs trying to get our contracts right through the door just add the in, just add the genius idea to set up our own company we had no backing we was nobody in particular we wasn't gangsters we wasn't hard men we just two two lads dormant trying to chance it trying to get a lucrative contract right just genius idea 